All right, I suppose I can start. Um, the slide is still here indicating what um, the topic is about. My name is um, Yvonne Kishawa. I'm a lecturer at the um, Brussels School of uh, International Studies. I teach on uh, conflict and international development. A very warm welcome to you all. So um, today's topic is um, discussion around Jonah Schulhofer Ball's book called Quagmire in uh, Civil War. So we're very, very pleased to have um, Jonah with us this afternoon or this morning. Um, everybody seems to be on different time zones these days. So I'm not sure uh, where the uh, participants uh, are. And before um, turning on Jonah's video, um, I will say a few uh, words uh, about him and um, then um, he will join us um, immediately after. So Jonah is the author of this book, which is super ambitious, which I'm going to uh, detail um, in a few uh, seconds, but um, I will say a few words about Jonah's trajectory so far. So right now, Jonah is an assistant professor of political science at uh, the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. He specializes in the study of civil war, and he adopts a comparative perspective uh, with a focus on the, the Middle East and particularly Lebanon and Syria. Recently, he has uh, written about violence uh, between armed groups that are aligned on the same side um, of the uh, civil war in Syria. So John is super productive because this book was published in 2020 and um, at in the same year, um, there's this paper published in Rationality and Society called On Side Fighting in Civil War, the Logic of Mortal Alignment in Syria. Before Leiden, Jonah uh, taught at the University of uh, Virginia. He was also a visiting assistant professor at Harvard's University's John Fitzgerald Kennedy School of Governor, Government. Sorry. He has held fellowships at the uh, Kennedy School and the School of Public uh, and International Affairs at uh, Princeton University. And his research um, has been supported by the uh, Social Science um, Research Council, the National Science Foundation, the Orient Institute in Beirut, and the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation. It's very prestigious. Uh, Founders. He um, received his PhD from Yale University, where he was um, affiliated with the program on order, conflict, and violence directed by Statis Calivas uh, that was happening in 2009-10. And that's um, actually when I first met um, Jonah. He was a brilliant PhD candidate uh, finishing his uh, dissertation while I was um, postdoctoral fellow, and he was this very impressive uh, student, always asking um, plenty of uh, brilliant questions during seminars, very impressive uh, erudition. Um, Jonah has lived in Syria and Lebanon, and he is fluent in Arabic. Jonah, please turn on your microphone and your uh, video, and I will explain how the uh, session is going to unfold. So, um, I will um, have a sort of uh, conversation with um, Jonah around the book uh, instead of having just the proper uh, presentation. But the questions I'm going to ask Jonah are very much uh, basic and concern the key arguments and the key methodologies that uh, he has adopted in uh, his uh, book. Um, while I do this, uh, please feel free to type your questions and anything that crosses your mind in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, once we are done with this uh, mini conversation, um, we will then check um, your questions and uh, continue the um, conversation with um, you. So that's how um, we're going to work together. That's pretty straightforward, I think. Um, we don't see you, uh, we just see the uh, Q&A uh, box, and that's how we can interact with the participants of this um, session. So let's start this conversation. I wanted to say a few things about the book, which I found super impressive. It's a very ambitious book, uh, and um, specifically around this concept of quagmire, which is 
uh, new in the uh, field of um, political science. And of course, everybody has heard about um, um, quagmires applied to complete situation in the media, but um, Jonah is somehow elevating the concept and making it um, an analytical category. And that's um, the first question I'm going to um, ask him. But before that, a few more words about um, the um, wide range of topics that the book covers. Uh, the book is about civil wars and foreign interventions at the same time, uh, which uh, tends to be studied classically in uh, civil war literature as processes of regionalization or internationalization of uh, civil wars. So, like we have um, a theory uh, here that um, embraces the um, domestic dynamics and the international uh, dynamics, um, and that to me feels an important gap in the literature on the civil war, and it's done in a very, very rigorous manner and in a very systemic, systematic um, manner. So um, Jonas' book is a sort of um, very important contribution, I think, to so-called multi-party wars uh, that have an international uh, character. So if you uh, push the logic far, the, um, the, the, the book also um, fills a gap uh, between comparative politics and international relations. And I hope we will have participants asking questions on this uh, specific uh, connection, uh, which to me is very, very important and makes um, uh, Jonas' book um, extremely um, valuable. Um, the, the book is, is not just an intellectual exercise, like Jonas uh, is basing his findings on a very, very long fieldwork in Lebanon. Uh, and um, the book has two chapters that are super descriptive and detailed uh, and also very, very well structured um, about the um, civil war in Lebanon that uh, serve a theoretical uh, purpose. So um, from a methodological perspective, the use of mixed methods through uh, qualitative uh, case studies um, and the um, connection with an ambitious uh, theoretical uh, uh, project is, I think, uh, quite a, a feat. Uh, and um, to make the exercise even more sophisticated, uh, Jonah adds um, two more case studies, um, Yemen and Chad, which are used to uh, check the validity of the uh, theoretical claims. And he also offers a very, very um, um, quantitatively sophisticated uh, chapter um, relying on statistical evidence, again, to um, check the validity of um, the theoretical claims that are uh, made. And he's not forgetting um, the human realities of war. Um, I find um, this part of the book also um, quite um, um, welcome and also moving. Um, uh, all of this um, uh, is, is, is made clear by, by, by Jonah, like it's not an intellectual exercise, like the notion of quagmire also captures um, human suffering um, and um, all the human losses associated with uh, protracted uh, conflict. So I'll stop here and start uh, with my very first question for um, Jonah. What is a quagmire and how is it different from the classic perspectives that we have in the literature on civil wars about conflicts that last forever and that seem entrapped, locked, um, such as um, protracted conflict, um, intractable conflict. These words, this concept exists in the literature, but you found necessary to add one more concept. So what is the value of this new concept you're introducing? So let me start uh, by saying a uh, very uh, uh, big thank you to Yvonne and BSIS for inviting me and for this very generous uh, introduction, Yvonne. Uh, I'm really um, glad to be here with you to discuss the book um, and really much looking forward to uh, your questions and those of the attendees here today. Uh, so you're right, it's, it's important to kind of explain why the need for uh, having a new concept like this, um, particularly when 
Um, as you mentioned, if we look at the reality of civil wars, there's enough going on there to deal with. Do we really need to add the concept into the mix? Um, but what I noticed was that um, the concept of quagmire is kind of out there already in public discourse and particularly in policy debates. You hear it applied quite regularly, actually, uh, when it comes to particularly to foreign intervention in a civil war. So you'll hear people say that um, or, or pose the question, is uh, Yemen, Saudi Arabia's quagmire? Um, and you find this label applied going back in history, all the way back to the Vietnam War for the United States. Um, and there's an aspect to it there that's really focusing on uh, what foreign powers do. But what I thought was important was that uh, in discussions of quagmire, really those are centered on this idea of entrapment at the end of the day. How is it that a country gets stuck in civil war? And when I thought about that more, I thought that um, that's something that, that really deserves to be thought through for the civil war belligerents themselves. Um, it's not just something that could potentially affect a foreign power, but we should think about this from the standpoint of the groups that are fighting in the war, is it possible to become entrapped in civil war? And that's where I saw that there is a, a big distinction between what uh, many studies focus on when it comes to uh, sort of the duration of civil wars or protracted conflict or these other kinds of categories um, that uh, entrapment or quagmire, as I'm calling it in the book, that's quite distinct from these. So, um, for example, you can uh, imagine civil wars that last a long time. Um, for a variety of factors that really don't have to do with uh, decisions by the belligerents that continue fighting, but these are things that are affected by the terrain of the country, perhaps by the nature of the war. Is this a kind of a war of national liberation against the colonial power? Uh, all of those things might affect duration. And at the same time, uh, because the length of wars is determined by many uh, kind of external factors that are going on and shocks to the country and so on, you could potentially have a war that is uh, ends up being quite short, but does feature some form of entrapment. So at the end of the day, um, I define the concept as centering on the incentive structure for belligerents. And in particular, uh, quagmire exists if for at least one of these belligerents, uh, the cost of exiting the conflict is higher than the cost of continuing to fight. But what I want to say is that even though it's defined with respect to one belligerent, this is actually something that affects everyone fighting in the conflict. Because if one of the parties to the conflict has these kinds of incentives, then it, it almost doesn't matter uh, what their opponents do. Uh, they're not going to respond in this in a quote unquote normal way to uh, having additional costs to fighting to other parties winning battles because they have this kind of special incentive structure. So that um, is what I investigate in the book. What causes quagmire? What causes that kind of entrapment in a conflict? Um, and I think that from the standpoint of the impact of civil wars, this is important to investigate because um that kind of entrapment means that all the costs of war at the end of the day are really compounded um the human costs of war grow because of that entrapment if you think even about people who are sort of um participating in the conflict as combatants as political figures they might be willing to sacrifice in order to uh, further their cause but if this war is really stuck in this way then all those sacrifices sort of come to nothing and, and because the war continues on in this uh, entrapped setting. So that's the, the concept, hopefully in a nutshell, and why I think uh, this is something additional when it comes to the study of civil wars, something that existing uh, research on civil wars hasn't really looked at. Thank you uh, very much. Now, going further into the logic of the 
model itself. So you stop me if I'm wrong, but it's a sort of two level game that you are representing with domestic actors and uh, foreign actors, right? Um, and of course, what each belligerent decides to do depends on uh, what you call the stakes uh, and the costs of uh, continuing the war. So how uh, would you um, detail the mechanism that eventually leads to this um, entrapment uh, that you call um, quagmire? Yeah, so um, what I try to do in, in part of the book in a theoretical chapter is to make a lot of simplifying assumptions to say what's kind of the core of the interactions that are going on in a civil war that would be important to look at to understand what's happening with Quagmire. And there, I, as you said, it's, it's a two, kind of a two level framework. So we have on the one hand, uh, the groups that are fighting in the war, the warring parties or belligerents. And uh, in a different level, you have international states uh, that are potentially interested in the civil war because they have certain interests or goals with respect to the civil war country, and they can act as foreign backers for the groups that are fighting. And so the question is, uh, what happens in both of these levels, but also the way in which the levels are connected to each other? Um, if uh, the warring parties um, face certain incentives, uh, what effect does the potential for outside support or the provision of outside support have on their decision making? And uh, for these foreign powers, given the existence of the civil war, what impact does that have on whether they're interested in providing support to the warring parties and so on? So um, this is where the book really tries to connect these different features of civil war, the fact that civil wars happen in an international system, in an environment in which uh, foreign governments are quite interested in what's going on in those civil wars, but they're not always interested in them for the wars in and of themselves. It's often um, having to do with international competition, wanting to avoid uh, your rivals getting an edge. Um, and so that can uh, create the incentive to provide this support and then it, the support itself factors heavily into the calculations of these warring parties. So you ask, okay, so given this kind of setup, what, what mechanisms exist that lead to quagmire? And the book highlights two of these. Um, the first is, is what I call uh, foreign assistance as a subsidy. So here you basically can think of this that uh, any support going to the warring parties, and I call it foreign assistance because I'm really thinking about a wide range of things. This could be, of course, um, actual provision of troops and military aid, but it could be financial, it could be diplomatic, really any inputs into the civil war uh, for the benefit of one side that are coming from a foreign power. And what those do is they expand the range of conditions under which uh, that armed group will uh, be able to continue fighting. So it's in that sense that it's a subsidy. Without this, uh, that group would be forced to make different decisions. With the foreign assistance, it's able potentially to decide to continue to fight in conditions that otherwise wouldn't. And with that first mechanism in place, there's then a second mechanism that can potentially come into operation, which is one that um, is uh, perhaps less intuitive to understand. And that's uh, that if you think about fighting, not just as fighting only, but that there are different kinds of fighting and uh, some techniques in war have higher costs associated with them than others. So I know that sounds abstract, but you know, to think about it concretely, Basically, taking territory in a war is uh, the thing that um, uh, armed groups really want to be able to achieve. That's what leads you to victory. But taking territory is very costly. Uh, it's costly in lives uh, in order to take territory because typically defenders have an advantage. And so you have to attack with a greater number of forces and casualties can be high. But in addition, once you take that territory, then you have to hold it. So then you have to station forces there to be able to continue to have it. 
And um, once you realize that in many wars, and of course in civil wars, there are other ways to fight. You don't just have to take territory, but you can uh, engage in non-territorial fighting. You can carry out um, terroristic attacks on the other side. You can bombard the other side long distance. You can do many things that are not just about seizing territory. And those have this lower cost because they don't have uh, the same implications for how many troops you need to have, uh, taking risks in terms of casualties, et cetera. And what that means is that um, usually in, in sort of standard views of civil war, any kind of increase in the costs of war should push the parties to negotiate or stop fighting, right? Uh, this is possibly one of the single, I think, biggest um, I wouldn't call it an assumption. This is sort of a, a received wisdom on how civil wars work. This is how international actors like to deal with them. This is how the UN likes to deal with them. We think, okay, imposing sanctions on a civil war country, this will raise the cost of fighting for these armed groups that will get them to stop. And what the book is saying is that once you look at different kinds of fighting that have these different costs, it's actually quite possible that when the costs of war increase, you don't get any kind of uh, pressure for settlement or any kind of pressure to stop fighting. Armed groups can just substitute into a lower cost type of fighting, this non-territorial fighting. So this substitution between uh, types of fighting, that's really the second mechanism that the book examines. Um, and for both of those, uh, the book uh, tries to get at them um, in, in a variety of ways. So I look at them uh, in this chapter on turning points in the war in Lebanon, and in, in particular, why the militias in Lebanon made the choices they did. And then I also try to look um, in these comparative cases with Chad and Yemen to see, um, is the way in which those wars played out consistent with the mechanisms from the theory? So, in some sense, uh, the book is, is kind of starting at this very zoomed out level of just what is this concept of quagmire, but then trying to propose a very specific pathway that quagmire can occur in civil war and then investigating that pathway. Okay, super interesting, thanks. And just to clarify about the involvement of um, international backers. So do they intervene because they receive an invitation to do so by the domestic actors, or do they just intervene on the basis of the stakes and the costs that um, they will uh, face uh, should they intervene um, or not? So what is in fact the interaction you're thinking of uh, between the domestic actors and the foreign powers? So uh, I'm glad you asked that because this is, um, it's something where the book um, on the one hand is kind of taking an abstract view of it, but then we see this play out in a variety of ways in examples from actual civil wars. So um, in the theoretical chapter, I, I look at this in a game theoretic model and basically there, uh, the idea is just that uh, there's a kind of simultaneous uh, interaction um, going on where there are two foreign powers and they decide should they offer support to the warring parties. So in that sense, um, in the theoretical component, I'm saying we first think about these foreign states and do they want to offer support given that there's an ongoing civil war? I think there are actually good reasons um, to think that this does capture what happens in civil wars. Uh, if you look at the civil war in Syria, the fighting starts and foreign states look at this and they say, what should we do? Should we support one faction or another? And that happens even on the government side. Uh, so it, it can be the case that uh, armed groups are going out and soliciting support and governments are soliciting support, but there's also, whether they do it or not, there's an aspect to this where this is a foreign policy problem that foreign governments look at as well and even if they're not approached for support, they may very well uh, go to a foreign government or go to the armed groups that are fighting that government and say, um, this is kind of our offer. 
in the book, I show how this happens in Lebanon to some extent and how some of the militias were very actively going out and trying to um, get offers of support or get agreements to provide certain military assistance. Uh, and they were doing this, you know, kind of as a form of diplomacy almost. And there are other uh, scholars who write about rebel diplomacy. Morgan Kaplan, for example, has a book manuscript about this. Um, so you see it from both directions, both from the side of the warring parties, but also from the side of the foreign states. And do the foreign backers estimate the chance of winning on the basis of the capabilities of the domestic actors that they choose as an ally? Yeah, um, so, so this is where the book um, reaches a conclusion that um, for these foreign parties, at the end of the day, um, of course, they would like the side they're supporting to win, and therefore, they are trying to consider, you know, what can this side achieve. But at the end of the day, because they're also focused on international competition as a first priority, they just don't want to lose to their rivals. So they don't want it to be the case that other states that they have a rivalry with or animosity towards are able to get the advantage. And that means that they're actually going to end up supporting groups, even if there isn't necessarily uh, this expectation that that support will lead them to winning. So that's where you get a kind of paradoxical outcome that um, you have all these actors, they're all behaving rationally in the theoretical model. They're all trying to get what they want and they all end up in making choices to get what they want. They all end up producing this really bad situation sort of overall for everybody involved. Um, so I think, you know, especially uh, from your own work and also thinking about fields of international development, this is kind of a familiar scenario where rational actors end up making choices that result in a second best outcome that generally we would hope to avoid, but ends up being produced nevertheless. Yeah. And so the foreign interveners don't just look at the domestic actors and what they can achieve through them, they also look at their international rivals, right? Yes, and, and, and that's why um, at the end of the day, it doesn't take very much, uh, at least that's the argument of the book, it doesn't take very much for foreign states to get involved in civil wars. They're not just involved in civil wars that are uh, sort of really close to their core interests. Because of international competition, they only have to have a small amount of interest in the civil war country, and that's enough to get them somewhat involved, and that's where this problem starts. Having said that, in the quantitative chapter that you have, like the statistical analysis, the proxies that you use to capture the interests of the foreign interveners tend to be mostly economic variables. Am I correct? Yes. So um, I, I try to look at this um, in a variety of ways. And you're right, the, the quantitative chapter basically says, well, um, we can understand that states define their interests in, in many ways and, and these have complicated strategic dimensions to them. But if we have to measure it, what can get at that? And I think economic interests uh, are an important strategic uh, dimension to what states pursue. And so uh, that was one of the core variables that I wanted to look at. Um, so I look at uh, one measure of um, the level of a civil war country's imports uh, from uh, certain foreign powers as a measure of foreign interest. Another one, and again, it's quite crude in the quantitative analysis, but I think it uh, can capture this. Another measure is distance from foreign powers. Basically, uh, countries that are really peripheral in the world system in general are, are of less interest uh, to foreign powers. But this is where this argument about the low threshold level of foreign interest comes into play. It doesn't take that high an interest. And so that's something that's nice in the quantitative analysis. You can actually observe that there is this threshold effect that some countries really um, don't have enough uh, interests from foreign powers such that you would expect this kind of intervention. But once you reach a very low level, then you expect to see it. 
And what the quantitative analysis is doing is saying, um, you know, we, we shouldn't uh, measure actual intervention in these civil wars because then you're going to run into methodological problems. Basically, this intervention is endogenous to foreign interests. It's endogenous to um, many other variables that are uh, important in the civil war itself. So we should measure something that exists prior to the civil war starting, and we can find these sort of rather objective measures of foreign interest that should tell us when there's an incentive to intervene. Okay, I get it. Um, I have one more question, and then we'll turn to uh, the chat because there are already some questions there. I have plenty more questions for you, but um, let's... Um, um, uh, open the discussion to uh, the participants. My very last question before we read out the questions in the chat is, okay, so not all conflicts these days are quagmires. Um, you have created a new category <laughs> which you need to populate. So what, what are the quagmires uh, today um, if you look at um, the state of global affairs? That, that's a great question. So um, I, I think in, in looking at uh, civil wars that are ongoing today or that have occurred recently, uh, there are kind of two challenges. One is to say, um, can we collect evidence to show that this uh, entrapment is going on? Basically that for at least one of the warring parties, there's this uh, incentive to continue to fight rather than exit, that the costs of continuing are lower than the costs of exit. And I think you can do that for these civil wars, but that's a very intensive effort that's involved. Um, a second way you can look at it, which the book does in the quantitative chapter is to say, um, can we measure this by looking at civil wars that lasted uh, significantly longer than we would have predicted? And that's a kind of indicator that this entrapment is going on. So notice that's different than duration in that it's saying we have an expected duration and then we have an actual one and is the distance between the two sufficiently large that it's kind of a diagnostic clue that quagmire occurs. So if I look at civil wars going on today, which are ones that might fit that, um, I, I think you have uh, a number of candidates. Uh, the war in Afghanistan, which has basically been ongoing since 2001, uh, is, is a good candidate for this. Um, and it's not because it's that long, it's because of the way in which uh, the warring parties really seem to be stuck there. Uh, and how uh, the Afghan government uh, certainly is getting a lot of foreign support, and that's key to the choices it's making, right? Um, you see negotiations with the Taliban or not, depending basically on the extent to which the United States is interested in that. And on the Taliban side, they're of course also getting foreign support. Uh, Libya uh, and Syria might also be good examples of this. Again, uh, when you look at the inputs into these wars and what the uh, belligerents can do, it's crucially dependent on foreign support. Uh, you have times in the civil war in Syria, for example, where uh, the government is basically close to collapse and they get an infusion of support. Um, in the early years of the war, this was once in the form of um, basically uh, having uh, salaries paid by foreign powers. They flew in pallets of cash that I think were printed in Austria and then the government could pay salaries without being able to pay salaries. Um, the government might well have been on the verge of collapse and then you get a different outcome. The rebel groups in Syria are getting weapon systems from the outside, these uh, wire guided missiles that they use against tanks, small arms, uh, even heavier weaponry. And basically um, when you look at it from the ground in Syria, what a rebel group was deciding in 2012, 2013, 2016, basically at any point in this war, really depended on what they thought they had from outside. It was never just about Syria. So I think that those elements are present there. Um, and um, then, then uh, you kind of get this um, question of, um, you know, if if these elements are happening in those civil wars, how do you get out of them, right? Um, 
The war in Syria still is dragging on. The war in Libya, the war in Yemen, Ukraine also. So how do you get out of that trap? And maybe that's a question I should leave for a, a separate part of this discussion. But I think, um, especially when you look at the current global situation, um, it doesn't seem enough just to identify what these quagmires are, but then we want to figure out what do we do with that information. Okay, yeah, we will expand on this, I think, later in this conversation. I'm now looking at the chat and I'm seeing Reda's comment. Uh, your work is very fascinating, Jonah. I have a couple of questions based on the very uh, positive book reviews that your book has received. So Claudia Seymour uh, says that your work often represents only two actors at each of the domestic and international levels. Once again, this choice may be justified for theoretical purposes, but for what end if the aim is to contribute to understanding conflict um, realities? So that's the first part of the question. Perhaps uh, I, I will read the uh, second part after you answer this part. Thank you, Reda, for this great question. So um, this, is, this is one of those uh, dilemmas that you face in, in kind of trying to get to the bottom of civil wars that in their reality are super complicated and messy. Um, and as you point out, uh, many civil wars are multi-party affairs. You can't just say there's one group fighting on either side. So it goes beyond that setup of two opponents in the domestic arena and two opponents in the international arena. I think um, that it's, it's a good kind of simplifying assumption to make because it allows us to understand, even if the war, war were more simple than it actually is, can you still get this kind of an outcome? And so the answer theoretically is yes. And then we would want to ask, okay, if the war is more complicated than the theory assumes, what are the consequences of that? So I think um, you, you can um, look at several kinds of consequences. If you have uh, multiple foreign states that are potentially backers for the groups in the civil war. This creates a kind of competition among those states um, that could be beneficial to the warring parties that might let them get better offers of foreign support, right? If they're not just reliant on one state and to take or leave the offer that it's providing, they could uh, potentially uh, get backing elsewhere, then maybe that state will have to uh, back them even in a wider range of circumstances than it might otherwise be interested in. Um, and, and I think to some extent you, you can see this where uh, there are groups in, uh, say, the civil war in Syria that uh, some states don't want to work with, but that doesn't put them out of the fighting anyway. They just find another backer, and not even because that other state is that interested in them or close to them ideologically, but because there are other states involved, they want to have uh, some skin in the game. They want to be backing a group. So this competition internationally, uh, I think, can make this kind of uh, dynamic plausible in a wider range of circumstances. The flip side of it, what if you have multiple groups in the civil war itself on both of the two sides? Um, then I think um, that uh, in addition to just sort of amplifying the dynamics I'm describing, it adds other ones into the picture, right? Um, there's existing work that, that shows that uh, basically the more parties you have to a conflict, uh, the greater the possibilities are that it's hard to reach an agreement. Um, you have bargaining failures. Uh, in other work, um, you have questions of shifting alliances, groups switching sides in the war, all of these are exacerbated with multiple parties. And so that's where um, I, I should emphasize, the book is not saying that it has the theory of quagmire that covers everything. It's trying to highlight one particular way in which quagmire can occur via this strategic interaction. And because I think there are many other, there are possible other ways that it can occur, um, it makes those simplifying assumptions to show that this channel indeed can be present. When we add in then the more complex realities of war, we can see that there are other factors to consider, but having uh, sort of 
uh, simplified them initially lets us see that indeed you can have that path to quagmire that the book is describing. So I, I hope that I've answered your question, but it's, this is kind of a difficult one because uh, at the end of the day, there's no good way to balance those two things, the need for analytical simplicity, but the need for attention to the realities of civil war. Okay. Reda, please tell us in the chat if uh, you're happy with um, Jonah's answer while I read the second part of the question. As once noted by David Keane for the beneficiaries of violence, prolonging a war can often uh, be as useful as winning it. The label of foreign backers seems a bit state-centric. The state as such is just one of many actors who have vested interests in civil wars. Um, this is as true in Lebanon as in Chad and Yemen and all of the conflicts mentioned in this book from uh, financiers of belligerents, sometimes states, sometimes private actors, to arms manufacturers, to legitimate commercial interests, to illicit traders, to even the United Nation, globally interconnected interests did and still do benefit. So yeah, I, I think this question has to do about the, the relevant actors. Your framework considers states and warring parties as unitary actors, but there's of course a um, much diverse range of um, groups of interest that uh, intervene in war. So how would you connect the, um, this um, um, very complicated world of people who have uh, stakes and interest in conflict? So I'd, I'd like to uh, answer maybe two parts to what I see in this question. And the first uh, is about why the state-centric focus in the book. Uh, and there um, I make this decision because I think that states bring something unique to the table when it comes to waging war. Even if we think about the United Nations in and of itself and peacekeeping operations, none of those can exist independently of states making contributions to the United Nations in military personnel, material, intelligence, logistics, any aspect of these operations. Uh, and if we go beyond the UN and just think about, well, uh, armed groups in a particular war getting uh, support from the outside, there's of course great uh, literature that looks at diaspora support in civil wars that looks at kind of private financing. Um, and there are interesting studies of this that try to calculate basically how much money does it actually take to start and uh, maintain an armed group. Uh, so it's not that this is something that's um, completely outside the reach of other actors that are not states, but states have the um, depth of experience when it comes to military matters the uh, expertise on them, the capabilities, and, and I think this is really crucial, the ability to make things happen quickly, which other actors in the international system or other private actors don't necessarily have. If you, if you want to transfer uh, $10 million to an armed group fighting in Libya, who can do that easily and fast? That's a state. That's not going to be just your uh, sort of any uh, diaspora or any individual or any company. Um, and that's because of the way in which states at the end of the day kind of monopolize uh, power in the international system and indeed within their own borders. So I think uh, you're, you're very right in pointing out that we have a whole other range of actors involved, but I think there are good reasons to focus on states to, to understand really the core of what's happening. The second thing I want to answer that I think is embedded in your question is, is this very important idea of uh, to what extent can we say that some actors actually benefit from and prefer war to peace? Um, and this is basically a, a kind of uh, literature um, that you could label the war economies literature that says really um, there are these kind of unique interests that develop during conflict that then um, uh, make it important to sustain conflict. Uh, that uh, could be states, it could be corporations are benefiting from this war system or ecology of war within a country. 
and want to maintain their interest in. And the book tries to engage with this literature in that I think there's a very important observation in it, which is that what happens during war can be very different than what happens during peace. And I tried to pick up on that in looking at the support that foreign states are providing during war. But what I think that literature um, has a potential problem with is this uh, idea that truly uh, any of these actors benefit from conflict more than they could benefit from peace. So it's, it's really a counterfactual issue. Nobody's saying they don't get profits during conflict. The question is, could they get higher profits not during conflict? And I think as a, as a kind of theoretical but also empirical matter, um, most of the actors that are identified as benefiting from war economies would get greater benefits from somehow maintaining the degree of involvement or control that they have during the war, but just maintaining it on a peacetime footing. Um, they wouldn't have to pay for uh, the investments in protection and arms and all kinds of things that are necessary to operate in the war environment, and they could still reap all the benefits from it. So that's where I think that war economies literature uh, has some kind of issues with it. But I want to pick up on that basic and really essential insight that it has, that what happens during a war is not just a kind of continuation of the pre-war peacetime scenario, and then in fact, unusual things, things unique to the war environment can happen. Thank you very much. We have a question from Delina. Thank you, Jonah, fascinating research. Could you expand a little on the change in methods? And Delina is referring to the second mechanism, which I forgot about. So maybe you remember it, Jonah. Yes, so, so Delina, thank you for this question. I think, um, and please correct me in the, in the chat if this is not the case, but I think you're referring to the change in the methods of fighting that armed groups are using in conflict. So the second mechanism was this idea of substitution between high cost territorial fighting and low cost non-territorial fighting. So um, there are examples of this in turning points from the war in Lebanon. Basically, in the war in Lebanon, for the first two years, you, actually, you had changes in the territory that the groups were holding. But after those first two years, 1975, 1976, through to the end, all the way to 1990, uh, the kind of dividing lines barely shift between the two sides in the war. And this is kind of puzzling when you look at major events in the war. So in 1985, for example, uh, there's the tripartite agreement, which is one of the major peace agreements in the war. Um, it involves all the major warring factions. They reach this agreement. This is seen as the possibility of, of bringing the war to an end. And then um, you actually have it collapse, not because of a breakdown in trust between the two sides, but because there is a kind of political maneuvering within one camp on one side of the war where uh, one faction uh, doesn't like the settlement or sees political advantage in backing out of it. So that's interesting. And I think there, you know, it, it's fascinating events in and of itself. It's not particularly surprising that, you know, once you understand that these uh, sides are made up of different competing political elements, that one would see an advantage in backing out of the agreement. What really truly surprised me in, in the interviews I was doing was to see that for the side that backed out of the agreement, there were basically no consequences to doing so. So I would have thought in the war, and particularly because the side that backed out of the agreement was from a military standpoint, not as strong as the other side, I would have thought that backing out of it would actually be pretty problematic for them, that the other side would then escalate in the war, maybe take territory from them and so on. And in fact, that doesn't happen. Uh, you basically get this kind of restraint from the more powerful side, even though the other side had gone back on the agreement. So how can you explain that restraint? He, this is where I think the substitution mechanism is really key. 
um, this other side in, in the conflict, the more powerful side, and I'm apologizing if this is abstract, but I don't want to drop too many proper nouns on you about you know who's who in Lebanon. Uh, but um, the, the more powerful side basically sees that um, there's a higher cost to going and taking that territory that it's maybe not willing to pay. Um, the support that it's getting from the outside and so on is helpful, but is it at a level that will actually facilitate taking territory and uh, just winning the war outright? Not necessarily. So you see that mechanism as one of the explanations for at this turning point why the strong don't escalate, despite many incentives, what we would think are incentives to do so. Um, and then uh, what's quite helpful is that you can also see ways in which um, these territorial operations are considered. So the commanders I interviewed explained sometimes the plans that they had for full-scale operations that would basically win the war and, and uh, destroy the other side. But then they um, would go through how it was that they didn't actually start those operations and who basically pulled the plug on it and why. And when they pull the plug on it, then you see a period of time in which basically they try to wear down the other side to make that operation less costly. So they're very consciously looking at um, how difficult and costly in material and in financial resources and lives are these operations and do they have other options uh, where they don't actually have to resort to that. And again, that's why I think bringing um, some degree of nuance into our discussions of costs in civil war is very important. We can't just leave it at there's a cost of fighting and that's constant uh, and it applies to all kinds of fighting in civil war. If we want to understand the decisions that are made during these wars, we have to at least incorporate that reality that uh, these groups have different options and that the distinction between taking territory and doing non-territorial fighting is really a key distinction in the levels of cost. Thank you. Um, yes, you did address Delina's question, which I um, didn't understand um, uh, myself, but um, you two <laughs> understood each other, which is the most important. Sorry, Delina, for not um, understanding your question in the first place. We have a question from Miguel. Hello, Jonah. Sorry, but I failed to grasp the beginning of your the talk. I think you said that there is a difference between protracted conflict and quagmire. That's the first part of the question. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. So uh, let me just answer that first part. Basically, um, Protracted conflict, or also you might hear the term prolonged conflict, um, those seem rather close to the idea of entrapment and war, uh, but basically um, it, they're also used to kind of just apply to any conflict that's going on for a long time. And that's where I think they're sort of um, too close to duration. Um, and as I was explaining, there, there are good reasons to separate duration from quagmire. But the second reason that um, I define quagmire as something different from protracted or prolonged war is that um, protraction in particular is sometimes understood as basically the strategic use of time in war. So if you think about Maoist strategies for wars of liberation, um, the idea is that you basically use certain operations and certain kinds of tactics to draw the war out such that at one point you'll have the ability to confront this stronger opponent and win. And that means that it's not really entrapment. This is a feature of the war itself that leads to the choice of a strategy that uses time in this way. And so that's where I was saying, for example, if you envision an analysis of war duration, um, then you might say very reasonably, um, peripheral insurgencies of an opponent that's quite weak when compared to the state um, are likely to last much longer than other kinds of civil wars, for example, in which the military has split 
or there's a kind of attempt to take over the capital, they'll last much longer because those groups have actually chosen this protracted war strategy. They're deliberately trying to use time to their advantage, but that doesn't have to do with uh, the kind of entrapment where they don't want to exit fighting because it's more cost. Yeah, thanks. Additionally, it would be really helpful to have a brief overview of how the main themes of your book cover the Libyan conflict. So, so I'm glad you asked that because it, it gives me an opportunity to say something about how I hope the book will be read. Uh, because basically, um, the short answer is that, of course, the book doesn't cover Libya. Um, but I think that there are elements of it that we can see playing out in Libya. Um, as I've mentioned, you know, the, uh, the way in which uh, foreign states, so in Libya, you have to think about Turkey, Russia, um, to some extent, uh, the UAE, the United States, France, uh, these countries are providing support to different sides in the war. And sometimes that support is crucial to whether or not uh, they undertake certain operations in the war, whether or not they're actually seriously sitting down at the negotiating table, et cetera. So um, from the argument of the book, these elements that, that we think are important are present in Libya. But um, I shouldn't say too much more beyond that because of course I'm not an expert on the war in Libya and I can't sort of give you a very detailed um, rundown of specific points in the war in which this dynamic seems to be captured. What I'm hoping that the book does in terms of the way it's structured is that it allows um, people who really know different conflicts well, conflicts that aren't mentioned in the book, to read the book with uh, that conflict, so with Libya, for example, to read the book with Libya in mind and to be able to compare sort of uh, to the events that are described in the book for the wars that are covered there, to compare that to what's happening in the conflict that they know well. So the book hopefully um, will kind of allow one to draw parallels with those situations sometimes to draw contrasts with them, to see why it might not be the same, uh, to understand whether this argument does indeed apply. Thanks. So we have no more questions in the uh, Q&A box, but feel free to add some. I had a message from Tanya telling me that Boyan wanted to say something, but Boyan, um, I think the only way we can uh, hear about you is through the um, Q&A box. So feel free to uh, type your question there. Um, I was just um, reflecting on what you said about the use um, of time by some groups, which may very much characterize uh, situations of um, counterterrorism or um, global war against terror. So the wars that are called forever wars uh, and that, um, uh, I mean, correspond to these um, fronts of the war against terror are not necessarily quagmires, even though they last forever, right? So um, th I think that's an important um, distinction to make. And in, in some ways, I'd want to ask you more about for example, how you would see Mali fitting or not fitting into this uh, framework. Um, I, I think uh, there are clearly uh, some conflicts where, as you said, if it's, it's about a, um, an insurgent group that uh, we might even label a terrorist group that you know, really doesn't have territorial control is having this long-term strategy in mind that if we carry out some spectacular att attacks, then uh, people will join us. They'll see that the government is a problem over time. This will allow us to build up their strategy. Then I think you're right. None of that is really about entrapment and war. And that's why, uh, that's why the book kind of adopts this um, multi-method approach to investigating the question of quagmire, because in some ways what we want to know about uh, wars in, in determining whether they're a quagmire or not is really information intensive. We have to see what are the incentives and costs 
for the warring parties in a particular conflict. And that means we need to, in detail, understand how the war looked through their eyes. And so that's why I pursue that interview component of the book where I'm talking to former commanders from all sides of the war uh, in Lebanon to really understand what were the constraints they were under. Um, so that's also where I think the quagmire concept can be quite helpful if, if you apply it to the forever wars category that lets us understand that not all of these wars are quote unquote forever wars for the same reasons, which means that you can't then apply the same strategies if you're interested in bringing them to a close. Some of them might be forever wars because of uh, this uh, element of foreign involvement and the way that changes the calculus of the war warring parties. Others of them might be forever wars because of the selection of strategies by an insurgent group. And the solution to those two things is quite different. Um, one of the things that the book especially tries to highlight is that often foreign powers um, kind of believe that quagmires are something that just exists out there. So if you took the countries that are labeled as having forever wars, people would look at this category and say, you know, well, wars in the Middle East or South Asia or the Sahel, these are just difficult. These societies are difficult. Nobody's really been ever able to uh, institute good governance in them, or uh, there's just something about that area that that leads to wars of this type. And the book is really highlighting that with quagmires, they're actually constructed by virtue of foreign intervention in these wars. They don't exist independently of that, which means that the foreign powers that are then considering how to end these conflicts have to first understand their own role in actually creating the quagmire uh, that they're then uh, sort of appearing to discover and then trying to figure out how to deal with it. They're actually implicated in why this happens in the first place. So does foreign intervention prolong war? Yeah, um, so this is certainly um, a, a sort of important finding in research on civil wars and um, that's not, you know, the book is, is looking in that, but I wouldn't say it's a contribution of the book because many people have, have uh, looked at this and analyzed it very carefully uh, long before I, I wrote this book. What the book is trying to do is to understand several mechanisms through which uh, foreign intervention uh, actually leads to quagmire. And then um, quagmire is, basically uh, an outcome in which wars take longer than they otherwise would have. And so, so that's the kind of distinction. We know from the literature that foreign intervention is associated with long wars, but uh, it's difficult in, in some ways to understand, first of all, is foreign intervention associated with longer wars because longer wars have other characteristics that lead to foreign intervention? or is it actually responsible for the long duration? But then in addition to it, um, the, the quagmire perspective is basically saying, um, how, how does that entrapment occur? Why is it that foreign intervention leads to this? And it's proposing these particular pathways through which that foreign intervention has that happen. Yeah, uh, the important difference. Um, but no more questions in the chat. Then I continue with my own questions. Um, of course, we'll keep for the end the key question, which is like, how do we get out of the um, uh, quagmire? But I had a question about the, the way you characterize the interest. So um, you said earlier that it's not just uh, exclusively about um, economic interest, but there are thresholds, etc. You have Chad as a case study in your book. Uh, and Chad is a place where France has uh, intervened continuously. Um, according to uh, Africanist um, scholars, uh, and particularly um, interested in state making um, in the post colonial era, you will hear a lot of claims among this group of scholars that France eventually just um, 
reproduces um, its influence on the continent and considers uh, its former colonies as a sort of backyard on which it wants to um, maintain some sort of um, hegemony or, or influence. Like, does that correspond to the type of interest that your book also captures? Or, uh, I mean, what is the range exactly of variables that you would consider uh, relevant to study the interests of the foreign backers? I'm really glad you asked that, Yvonne, because this is where I think there can be a really productive uh, conversation between international relations scholarship and comparative politics scholarship, um, in the sense that a lot of the analyses of specific countries when it comes to military affairs are, are kind of coming out of a comparative politics perspective and basically saying, well, um, what should we understand about this country? And so from that perspective, um, it's clear that there are many interests that France has in Chad. From the international relations perspective, the question is, overall, are these important or not compared to all the other interests that France has? And that's where I think, um, you know, th this may be um, staking out a, a, a debatable position that I'll ultimately come under attack for, but I, I think it's safe to say that Chad is not a core interest of France. Um, there are many things that France is interested in there, but if Chad, um, if, if basically tomorrow it was impossible for France to somehow be involved in Chad, life would go on for French policymakers. Uh, I don't think it would be too much of a hardship, basically. I don't think they would face problematic questions from the electorate, I, I think that this would be relatively okay. Um, and there's um, indeed, um, there's a quote from one uh, scholar of Chad de Calo who says, um, when, when you thought about uh, Chad in terms of the French uh, empire and colonial service, that Chad was basically the furthest and most distant and most backwater of all the backwaters, that basically you couldn't um, do anything so bad that uh, you couldn't still be posted to Chad. It was always possible to be posted to Chad, whatever you'd done as a colonial official. Um, so that, that means it's really important to see kind of relatively where does it stack up compared to other interests, not just what does France have going on there that could be quite important, but is still outweighed by other interests? Um, yeah. I don't know if that helps. The no, and, and I suppose you can also switch your sort of domestic partner, right? Um, you may start a sort of joint venture with one armed faction and then uh, move to another one and eventually um, perpetuate some form of international influence uh, whoever runs the place. <laughs> I think mm. that's uh, how um, that can work as well. You mentioned it, yeah. It just, just, sorry, just to add in uh, one more thing. I think uh, something that, that the book doesn't really investigate, but that I'm interested in doing uh, sort of to follow up on it, is that um, one thing that comes across in analyses of the forever wars, for example, is that uh, foreign governments are making often uh, very inefficient choices or kind of not learning from their mistakes in these wars. And that's a very interesting phenomenon. It's something that's been observed, of course, in foreign interventions and wars uh, that were seen as relatively important to foreign powers like the Vietnam War and wars that are seen as relatively less important. But one question is, why is there less incentive to have learning? Why are these foreign powers not developing better strategies? And I think actually one of the potential answers to that is because these wars aren't that important. Um, if they were more important, there would be greater pressure to learn and change and advance on from these mistakes. Um, so, so I think that that creates a dilemma then, which is then, uh, if these wars aren't so important and the incentives aren't there for foreign powers to learn, how do you change foreign behavior given that set of circumstances? But, but I think it's an interesting question to explore. You mentioned the uh, electorate um, 
as a potential source of um, changes in uh, foreign policy and decisions to uh, intervene outside. Uh, so that's something that may be perhaps a bit missing from the book is uh, how each belligerent relates to um, their constituency, right? Uh, so you make the deliberate choice to represent them as unitary actors. Um, but in the end of the book, you also say that um, you engage with the uh, micro level approach of conflict, which is not entirely true, I think. <laughs> um, there's, there's of course plenty of recent literature um, about uh, micro level dynamics and how leaders and followers uh, interact within armed groups. Um, but that's not very much part of the scope of the, of the work, right? That's right. So, so um, no, you're absolutely correct in pointing that out. And of course, uh, this is coming from you as somebody who's uh, a key contributor to the micro level uh, research agenda. Um, what I would say is that it, it's, it connects with it in the type of research it does to investigate the macro level question. So, so it basically says, as the micro level research tradition on civil wars does, it's important to talk to the participants. We can't understand what's going on in these wars without doing so. Um, you're right that in, in terms of the theoretical assumptions and all the rest of it, it it's not um, engaging with uh, many of the advances that have happened in those areas and with many of the uh, types of problems that micro-level research tries to investigate, such as the leader-follower interaction, constituencies, et cetera. Um, it's not that I think it's not important. It's that I basically came to an understanding at some point in the project that it's not tractable to combine the two things, that it's, it would be just too many moving pieces. And so I think it is interesting to consider questions like, um, you know, does the type of relationship between leaders and followers or uh, leadership in a constituency with an armed group, does that type affect the extent to which some armed groups are more likely uh, to be subject to this entrapment incentive versus others? That's just something the book uh, doesn't deal with, unfortunately. And, and I think um, a lot of uh, the micro-level literature really makes advances by allowing us to think systematically about how armed groups are structured and how these uh, within group dynamics occur. What I would say, at least on the foreign dimension part uh, though, is that um, when it comes to sort of understanding possible explanations um, for decisions that lead to things like quagmire, there was already a long tradition that looked at sort of the internal bureaucratic politics of foreign powers when it came to intervention decisions in civil wars and that understood uh, basically relationships within the bureaucracy, electoral incentives for key leaders, um, cognitive decision-making biases, all of these things as possible pathways to decisions related to quagmire. And so what the book is adding is actually to say, we have a set of micro level factors that are kind of associated with it. Uh, the book's explanation is that strategic interaction in and of itself can produce quagmire, setting aside all of these micro level factors. Um, so I do think what you're outlining in terms of what happens in this black box of the armed group that's a really important dimension uh, for there to be further research on. Uh, but kind of my impetus to, to make that simplification uh, came out of the sense that we did have some types of understanding of how this can produce quagmire. And what to me seemed missing from the literature wasn't more attention to the micro level processes, but was actually how strategic interaction could do it. I get it. Um, so we've been talking for um, um, more than uh, one, what, one hour and 20 minutes. And, um, we still have a bit of time. And for the, perhaps the most important uh, questions of all, it's like, how do we get out of a um, quagmire? And 
Um, would, for example, a strategy whereby you change the perceptions of the costs and stakes like be a way to unlock a situation uh, of um, locked conflict? It, it's very important to consider, and, and I would say um, my hesitation in answering this uh, comes from the book, the book basically having a, a strong set of implications about what it takes to avoid quagmire, but um, I'm less certain when it comes to once you're in it, how do you get out of it? When it comes to avoiding it, the implications from the standpoint of foreign powers are that uh, very cautious strategies actually tend to produce quagmire. Um, strategies of saying basically, let's give a little support to armed groups, let's see what happens in the war. All of those cross this threshold level of support and then can produce quagmire. And so it's really all or nothing strategies that avoid it in the first place, either providing absolutely no support to an armed group which is probably more difficult than it sounds to do. Um, but considering the small things that foreign powers do on the edges of civil wars, to do absolutely nothing is a kind of drastic strategy. Or um, to basically go all in and provide uh, support to a warring group that really escalates beyond what the other international side in the war is able to do. These are things that would avoid quagmire in the first place. So then I think, of course, there is an implication that um, changing a foreign power, changing its strategy to those two extremes could, uh, could get a civil war country out of quagmire. Um, the reason I'm, I said I was a bit hesitant is then the question is, uh, why don't foreign states do that, right? And so I think you're left with a couple possibilities. One um, would be uh, if there is some actual kind of uh, foreign policy goal that the quagmire is satisfying, and the book doesn't, of course, address that uh, because it's trying to look at even if that wasn't the case, how could it occur? So maybe there is a foreign policy goal that's satisfied here. And the second one, of course, is how do you redefine national interests? Like, that's, that's not really an easy thing uh, to do, um, but I think you're onto something with that observation because um, as much as national interests uh, seem to be very thought out by governments and very well defined, there's a lot of uh, what you might call, for lack of a better word, wiggle room there. Um, you know, uh, politicians can basically redefine what a country's priorities are, or they can define a particular country, even if they keep the priorities the same, they can say, well, actually, we've not been understanding how this country fits into it. Um, for me, Syria is an important example here. Um, basically, and, and I've written about this um, in another piece on the Obama administration's uh, foreign policy making when it came to Syria. Uh, the Obama administration basically understood Syria as something that was ultimately a distraction from its main foreign policy goals. They were concerned about uh, the nuclear deal with Iran, and domestically they were concerned about passing health care reform. So decisions on Syria were never about Syria. They were sort of about minimizing the impact that Syria could have on other things that were important. I think... Um, that you could reasonably make the argument that they missed an important uh, foreign policy consideration with Syria, which was how would uh, an ongoing conflict in Syria that was not resolved, producing the number of refugees that it produced, uh, producing the destruction in Syria that it produced, what's the long-term impact of that on U.S. strategic interests? So you could say basically they were wrong in terms of how they perceived Syria as affecting U.S. interests, and other policymakers might then draw the conclusion that in order to deal with those interests, different courses of action were important. I think it's, it's more challenging to see how can you get out of quagmire if you assume that interests are just fixed and known and there's no disagreement about them whatsoever. 
Thank you very much. Um, we are just about to wrap up, I suppose. I, I do have one question about the cover of the book, um, which is Beirut. So I, I checked uh, on the back cover and I realized it was Beirut, but that's not very much the stereotype we have about the civil war in Lebanon, right? Where we imagine like gunfights and um, not somebody like uh, jumping from, <laughs> from a plane on um, the uh, capital city. So uh, it's 90, uh, 1982. So what, what is this specific episode about? Yeah, so... Um, and why did you choose that it? I was uh, interested in that image for the cover was sort of more what it suggested metaphorically, um, because the actual image, uh, this is something that Michael Nelson, who was a photojournalist, uh, took... Um, in 1982, and it's of Italian paratroopers doing a training jump over Beirut. So they, they were part of a multinational peacekeeping force there. They're actually jumping out of a helicopter. It's routine training. It doesn't really have to do with some uh, military operation. But um, sort of the image itself, I think, conveys some aspects of what the book is interested in with these different levels of interaction, with the sense of sort of entrapment in the quagmire and so on. Um, and then of course, um, you know, there are many aspects of the foreign intervention itself that maybe you don't get a, a nice image of that can encapsulate it, but very much did involve direct intervention uh, other than the gunfights and changing alliances that you're describing. So there are points in the war in which Syria or Israel intervene very directly with a lot of forces and, and really put their thumb heavily on the scales of what's happening in Lebanon. Um, I just, I, I saw this image at one point, I think I'd first seen not the same one, but one in a series of images that it was from in a French book on uh, the multinational forces in Lebanon. And it really, to me, seemed like a really striking image. So I was really uh, grateful to be able to find uh, Mike Nelson and that he was willing to give permission to use it for the book. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I see no more questions in the chat. Um, this was a very thorough conversation about the book, I think. Also very, very enjoyable. Um, Jonah, thank you very much for this. And um, again, like well done for, for this wonderful um, effort, which is um, very parsimonious uh, conceptually, but captures super complex um, dynamics. So um, uh, long life to the concept of uh, quagmire in academia. We'll see if uh, other uh, works get inspiration from it. Have you heard of um, papers already trying to engage with this concept or is it too early? I, I think it's too early. I, I certainly hope that it will be something that's useful for scholars studying civil wars going forward. Well, there's clearly, there's clearly material here for um, an entire new um, research agenda, I suppose. Well done. Thank you very much, Ivan. It's and been thank great you very to much talk for, with you about the book. For being with us um, at uh, BSIS. Take care. And um, uh, plenty more happening uh, at BSIS. And do consult the uh, website of the school to hear more about the future events. Thank you again, Jonah. And, um, Bye-bye, everyone.